Jean-Baptiste Say was a French economist who is probably best known today for what is commonly referred to as Say's Law. While he was an important popularizer of this law of markets, which was how it was referred to during Say's own lifetime, it was not his invention. Rather, it was a cornerstone of how the classical economists understood the market economy. As contemporary scholar Stephen Cates has argued, the term Say's Law is a 20th century invention, and the way it is often summarized today, that supply creates its own demand, was coined by John Maynard Keynes in his attempt to refute it. In its original usage, the law of the markets summarizes the nature of economic actions taken in a market where production is specialized under the division of labor. Specifically, that we produce in order to sell and then use the proceeds to buy what we really want. Market production is, in other words, indirect and not undertaken to directly satisfy one's own wants. We produce to satisfy other people's wants and can thereby satisfy our own by purchasing what others produce. This suggests market action is necessarily speculative and entrepreneurial, and that the specialized market economy is a money economy. Say made important contributions to both of these. In fact, he is the one who coined the term entrepreneur and defined it as the one who shifts economic resources out of an area of lower and into an area of higher productivity and greater yield. Another way of saying the same thing is that entrepreneurs act to procure resources that may already be used in productive enterprise and instead puts them to use in another productive activity, which the entrepreneur expects will be more valuable and thus offer greater returns. Say thereby puts the entrepreneur at center stage in the market economy. They use their industry, by which say means labor, to organize and direct the factors of production so as to achieve the satisfaction of human wants. Entrepreneurs are therefore forecasters, project appraisers, and risk takers. They advance funds to the owners of capital, land, and tools, that is capital, and only recoup this investment if they succeed in selling the product to consumers. In terms of money, Say explains how money emerges spontaneously in the market. He shows how one highly demanded commodity can evolve into an accepted medium of exchange, and thus become a money, an explanation that is reminiscent of but predates Menger's famous treatment by almost 70 years. To Say, money is a commodity that, because it has high demand and thus can function as an intermediary in trade, facilitates specialization under the division of labor. He, however, considered money to be neutral and thus not have an effect on the exchange of goods and services other than as facilitator of transactions. Money, he writes, performs but a momentary function in this double exchange, and when the transaction is finally closed, it will always be found that one kind of commodity has been exchanged for another. Say was a strong proponent of gold and silver as money. This was not because he was a gold bug, but because the precious metals have properties that make them highly suitable as money. They're durable, portable, divisible, have high purchasing power per unit, and are uniform. The exact form of money, and the good used as money, should be left to the interaction of consumers' preferences. As Say notes, custom, therefore, and not the mandate of authority, designates the specific product that shall pass exclusively as money. Part of the reason for Say's agnostic view of what good should function as money is likely his recognition that money's purchasing power rises and falls in proportion to the relative demand and supply. One of the reasons gold and silver function so well as money is that there is limited supply of those metals. If, as Say says, new and rich veins of ore should be discovered, then other commodities may be better suited as money than gold and silver. In other words, the exact supply of money is of little import as long as prices are free to adjust, and thus the purchasing power per unit is neither overpriced nor underpriced. Nevertheless, say preferred a money commodity with high purchasing power per unit to one existing in greater abundance, and thus would have lower exchange value. He also discusses banking and distinguishes between banks of deposit and banks of circulation, where the former function as warehouses for money and the latter are true financial intermediaries. The banks of deposits hold 100% reserves at all times and provide convenience as well as security in that they effect transactions on behalf of their depositors by transferring funds from one customer's account to another's, for which services they charge a fee. The banks of circulation, in contrast, hold fractional reserves, issue banknotes and generate an interest income by discounting promissory notes and bills of exchange. 
The banknotes issued by such institutions must be backed by specie or short-term securities. But if so, then the holders of the notes of a bank issuing convertible money run little or no risk, so long as the bank is well administered and independent of the government. Say even argues that these fractional reserve holding banks of circulation bestow a benefit upon society because they provide the advantage of ex economizing capital by reducing the amount of the sum kept in reserve. And if it happens that such fractional reserve banknotes also supplant part of the specie that had been in circulation, then the functions of the specie that has been withdrawn are just as well performed by this paper substituted in its stead. To say both of these types of banks were equally legitimate market institutions. In terms of the law of markets, or Say's law, the implication is that there can never be a general glut, and therefore no deficiency in aggregate demand, as for instance Keynes argued. It is certainly possible for there to exist a surplus or shortage of any particular commodity, which happens regularly as entrepreneurs fail to precisely anticipate and therefore meet market demand, but only in the short term. As all production is undertaken for the purpose of selling the goods and services produced in order to instead purchase goods and services that better satisfy the producer's want, the inability to sell becomes an inability to demand. We cannot demand unless we produce the means by which we demand, which means aggregate supply and aggregate demand are an identity, and consequently always the same. From the point of view of the law of markets, it is not a demand deficiency that someone is unable to sell what he or she produces, and as a result cannot demand goods in the market. Rather, it's the production failure that causes a reduction in effective demand. In other words, it is an entrepreneurial failure. If a government steps in to fuel demand, as Keynesians advocate, then this only subsidizes those goods that have been produced at a cost that does not represent the real social opportunity cost. Consequently, the entrepreneurial errors are propped up through policy, and the production becomes misaligned with demand for a longer time period. In stark contrast to Keynesian dogma, Say eloquently expresses that it is wholly beneficial for a society to experience generally falling prices whenever such declining prices are the result of productivity gains. Whenever they are not, they should be the result of entrepreneurial errors and will thus soon be corrected through the freely adjusting prices. Say notes that price deflation, that is generally falling prices, indicate that a country is rich and plentiful and that products formerly within reach of the rich alone have been made accessible to almost every class of society. While Say was not an Austrian economist, he was an important and influential economic theorist and should definitely be counted as a precursor of the Austrian school. For more content like this, visit Mises.org.